to one or two people who don't know you. Uh, the best way to introduce uh, Gregory is that he knows everything. Uh, the more uh, prosaic way of introducing him is that he is a professor of uh, applied math and statistics at Johns Hopkins with uh, secondary appointments in uh, the Department of Math, Physics and Astronomy, as well as Mechanical Engineering. And Gregory is uh, really a scholar and I'm uh, greatly looking forward to his uh, talk. I hope you will answer my question, the one that I posed for you about thermal noise. I will. Oh, except I did the wrong thing there, sorry. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to, to present our results. Um, this is work that we've been doing as part of our uh, Simons project, and uh, I have several collaborators on this work, uh, Dima Bandek, Alexei Malayabov, and Nigel Goldenfeld. Um, I do want to apologize in advance. Uh, this is a talk in the School of Mathematics, and we're not going to present any theorems. Um, but I think I'm going to try to raise questions uh, that I hope to convince you um, will uh, should lead to some important both physics and mathematics developments. So uh, let me let me go on. Okay, so I'm not going to start with the Navier-Stokes equation. So every talk on turbulence begins with uh, the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation for low Mach number fluids. But every physicist knows this is the wrong equation. Um, in reality, there are thermal fluctuations, as Srini pointed out. And the correct equation that incorporates those are uh, first proposed by Lando and Lifshitz in the 1950s. And there have been many, many tests of those equations for far from equilibrium, local equilibrium, but far from equilibrium flows. There's a nice book by Zerati and Sengers that discusses many, many different varieties of experiments and interesting non-equilibrium manifestations of the thermal noise. So here I'm just going to write down those equations for the case of the low Mach number limit. So again, these are quite standard. And these introduce a new scale into the problem. And what I'm going to try to convince you is that in addition to the intermittency effects that Srini was discussing, which historically, there's somewhat disagreement about this, but historically were first raised to some extent by Landau. Um, there's, uh, there's another, which is due to the integral scale as Srini pointed out. There's another dimensional quantity, which is the thermal energy, which also vitiates the 1941 dimensional analysis of Kolmogorov. And as I'm gonna discuss here, there's actually an extremely inter in interesting interplay between those two new dimensional parameters, the thermal energy and the, and the integral length. So um, I should start off by saying to, to reassure you that, I, that it's very difficult to define these equations as I've written them here. Okay, so these are stochastic partial differential equations, highly ill-defined, no one's ever made sense of these equations. But I'm not going to interpret them as stochastic partial differential equations. In fact, in statistical physics, this is not the usual point of view. What they're regarded as low wave number effective field theories, which means that you truncate them at some wave number capital lambda here. So this is just a, a, a nice spectral projection onto some finite range of wave numbers. Once you have done that, Everything is well-defined. And in fact, for, for the mathematical people, there's a really nice article by this written in a, uh, by Flandoli in 2008 that summarizes this. Once you've done this, you have a nice, well-defined stochastic dynamics. And the general view in the statistical physics community is don't worry about stochastic partial differential equations. All you have to do is, is make sure that when you truncate the system at this wave number lambda, um, as long as it's somewhere between the gradient length, which is the smallest sort of um, smooth scale of, of the flow and the mean free path, uh, and, and you get predictions that are insensitive to the choice, then you're fine, okay? So the predictions do not depend then on that cutoff parameter. And so that's the spirit in which I'm going to use these equations. Okay, now uh, let me just, uh, repeat some of the things that Srini already said. I'm going to start off about the effects of noise in the dissipation range. Uh, 
And so I'm going to take my equations and rescale them with a Kolmogorov length that here I'm going to somewhat unconventionally call uh, LK, not eta. And then I also have a Kolmogorov velocity. And if I non-dimensionalize the fluctuating Navier-Stokes equations, I immediately get the new parameter that I was talking about. I'm calling that theta K. This is the thermal energy relative to the energy of a Kolmogorov scale eddy. Okay, so I take the Kolmogorov velocity, I multiply it by the density, that's a kinetic energy um, uh, 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 per mass, and then I multiply by the volume of the Kolmogorov eddy, and this is the quantity that then multiplies that noise parameter, this white noise parameter. Um, there's also other scales, you know, there's the forcing scale. Um, uh, if, if I do have a force, most natural flows don't have body forces, but if I have that, then there's that additional dimensionless parameter. It's more natural to non-dimensionalize that with uh, integral scale units, in which case you get an extra power of Reynolds number here, which just means that um, at the dissipation scale, the, the direct effect of, the, of that integral scale forcing is small. And then of course, there's, there's the usual Reynolds number. Um, actually, Srini gave the example of the atmospheric boundary layer uh, with Reynolds number 10 to the seven. I'm considering the same example. Um, and here are some typical values of the parameters just to set the, the scales. Um, you know, the, the Kolmogorov scales of the order of a millimeter, uh, the, the Kolmogorov velocities, a few centimeters per second. And the important point is that this thermal energy, this dimensionless temperature uh, is very small. Okay, so that it's about 10 to the minus eight. And as, as Srini said, this has led to the assumption that you can generally ignore thermal noise until uh, you go to length scales that may be comparable to the mean free path itself. Okay, so that's sort of the standard assumption, but I'm going to dispute that. Okay, so let me discuss the, the turbulent energy spectrum. And again, I'm simplifying things here. There's a lot of story. I did, this is actually, I'm gonna proceed at the level of cartoons to begin with. So this is actually a cartoon. This is not a real spectrum. This is a plot with so, the so-called von Karman parameterization. And you have an inertial subrange with the Kolmogorov uh, five thirds law. Uh, then you have what I'm calling near dissipation range. This actually uh, agglomerates a lot of different physics. I mean, there are bottlenecks. There are various theories of how you make this transition, whether you get a stretched exponential, uh, a lot of, of still active interest about this region. And then you are supposed to go eventually to the so-called far dissipation range where you see an exponential decay. And there are even rigorous upper bounds that show that it has to be at least exponential, okay? But what about the thermal noise? Because the thermal noise should create at high wave number an equilibrium equipartition spectrum, okay? So we know that that's the effect of the thermal noise is it produces this K squared spectrum that's proportional to the temperature and divided by the density. And so we say, where does that appear? And so by the way, the, I'm, the, this plot is for the case of the atmospheric boundary layer that I was just discussing before uh, Reynolds number about 10 to the seven. Okay, well, we can estimate that crossover by just looking at the spectrum in this exponential decay range. It's roughly, I'm not gonna to be too careful here. I mean, rough estimates suffice. Uh, this is the, the standard exponential decay spectrum. And we want to equate that on order of magnitude with the equipartition. And we simply ask, where do they cross over? Okay, and so that's when this parameter becomes a word of unity. And where does that happen? It happens there. It doesn't happen at incredibly small scales. It happens at scales about 10 times smaller than the Kolmogorov scale. Okay, so um, uh, uh, this spectrum that you expect from, equip, you know, from, from the, the thermal forcing, the, the fluctuations, uh, appears quite early. Um, uh, the, the, um, uh, this scale, I should say, so we're actually going to claim that, that what you see in real turbulence is in fact not the far dissipation range. This exponential decay range uh, I'm going to claim is typically absent. Um, and what you're going to see in fact is replacing it is thermal equipartition. Um, we've actually done this calculation for a number of different flows. I mean, a lot of them. 
uh, many natural flows like the upper ocean mixing layer, uh, many recent experiments that are attempting to probe down to dissipation scales, like one of W.A. et al. a few years ago. The story is basically always the same. Uh, at a scale roughly 10 times smaller than the Kolmogorov scale, when you plot this equipartition spectrum in, it, it comes in only at a fact, you know, about 10 or 20 times below the standard Kolmogorov scale. Um, the, 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 this is also, by the way, seen in, in superfluids. Uh, I don't think it's ever been seen experimentally, but this kind of equipartition spectrum has been observed for about a decade in various kinds of superfluid simulations. Uh, most recently, Gross-Pitevsky uh, simulations of uh, Brache and Kristolovich. Um, now, why am I arguing that this is, is what you're actually seeing? I mean, what I've done here is very simplistic. I've just crossed the two spectra. But a simple physical consideration is that as the nonlinearity is dropping off here, it becomes quite weak. And on the other hand, the, the noise and the, the viscosity are both growing with wave number. And the, the time scale for that, the time scale to set up this, this equipartition is going to be governed by that viscous time scale. And so indeed, you expect that this is actually what you'll see by, a, by that simple physical reasoning. Now, of course, I don't expect you to accept on, on the face of it that physical reasoning. Um, uh, um, so I'm going to present sort of more detailed considerations to justify that. Um, but first of all, I want to note that this scale uh, where equipartition appears in the atmospheric boundary layer, we're arguing, is you know, on the order of a you know, few tens, a hundred um, uh, micrometers. Um, that's still much, much bigger than the mean free path, which is uh, you know, like 100 nanometers, 68 nanometers. So a hydrodynamic description is still valid in this range but it's not a deterministic hydrodynamic description, it's fluctuating hydrodynamics. Now, this seems to, to fly in the face of a lot of standard arguments that deterministic Navier-Stokes equations should hold. And in fact, this is based on underlying scaling symmetries of the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, where if you scale velocities to be small, uh, distances to be large and times to be even larger, with Reynolds number fixed, this is an exact scaling symmetry of the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. And it's this scaling limit that's used, this scaling that is used to derive the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation from Boltzmann equation or from stochastic lattice gases. So you might ask, why doesn't that standard argument apply? Uh, can't I simply scale things so that eventually I'll see the deterministic equations? Well, um, in a turbulent flow, what you find is that, in fact, if you do the standard scaling, uh, the, the energy dissipation rate gets extremely tiny. Simultaneously, the velocity gets tiny, but the, the Kolmogorov scale gets very large. And so this parameter, uh, theta k, this thermal parameter, does indeed get small. It gets small proportional to lambda. So as you scale things up, it gets tiny. And so you could argue that if I take a big enough system and small enough velocities, then I will be able to get purely deterministic equations and this term will disappear. But now you ask how small does that actually, how small does lambda have to get? Well, we know the relationship that determines this place where equipartition starts and how it relates to that uh, temperature parameter. And that's this relationship here. So for any theta k, I can find out where equipartition should begin. And if I want to double it, so if I have a certain range where, that, where I'm seeing an exponential range, and then I say, okay, I want to double that, you can just plug into this format and you find out that in order to double it, you have to take a lambda that goes like 40 to the x. So that means in the atmospheric boundary layer, if I want to go to a twice higher wave number than the one that I just was showing a moment ago, you know, like tens of microns, down to, you know, something a length scale twice as small, I would have to make the system 655,000 times bigger and the velocity 650,000 times smaller. So we're arguing that in practice, a far dissipation range with exponentially decaying energy spectrums 
doesn't exist. It's actually a virtual reality construct that probably doesn't exist in nature. And that what you'll really see is a thermal equipartition spectrum. And so as Srini emphasized again, uh, current experiments are actually not probing these length scales. Uh, there's no evidence uh, uh, about what's happening at, at scales smaller than the Komogorov scale. And what we're arguing is that just a few scales smaller, in fact, the deterministic Navier-Stokes equation is wrong. It's not physically the correct equation. Which leads to a lot of, of, of four important fundamental questions. Uh, one of them was already raised by Srini, which is the role of turbulent intermittency. Um, so the Komogorov scale is not the only scale. That would be, in the K41 theory, the, cut, the, the gradient length. But now the, the, we know that there are much smaller scales. Well, in that case, is a hydrodynamic description even valid? Um, also, um, uh, there's an important question raised for Srini and other experimentalists. If what we're saying is right, how can you check it? Um, how can you actually measure the fluctuating velocity uh, at scales below the Komogorov scale? And all the standard tools, such as PIV, hot wires, um, they have uh, uh, fundamental limitations that prevent you from doing the kinds of measurements that, that are necessary. So what you want to do is you want to measure local coarse grained velocities uh, averaged over scales, you know, below the Komogorov length scale. Um, by the way, the, I should mention the physical reason for this K squared, the fact that the velocities are getting so big, is as I think most people know that the, 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 the particles in the fluid, the molecules in the fluid are moving at tremendously high velocities. In a glass of water, the velocity is a kilometer per second on order of magnitude. And so as you, uh, as you, as you average over smaller and smaller scales, you start to see the central limit theorem corrections. If you average over big scales in a glass of water, the mean velocity is zero. But if you start averaging over smaller and smaller scales, those huge velocities start to appear in the central limit number corrections as large Gaussian thermal fluctuations. And in any case, at, at, at the moment, people can measure such things in laminar fluids, but it's extremely challenging to measure uh, this in a, um, a turbulent environment. We do have, however, small scale probes uh, that could see such effects. And in fact, there are many sub Kolmogorov scale physical processes that are known to be affected by thermal noise. And these are things like droplet formation. So in multi-phase flows relative to cloud formation and precipitation. Uh, in combustion, chemical reactions are affected by thermal noise. They can actually be quenched. You can actually prevent a chemical reaction from occurring. And so there are lots of very important and interesting questions about the interplay between the turbulence and the thermal noise at small scales. Okay, um, so let me turn, before I try to justify the picture, I'm gonna present uh, more of, the, um, of, of our claims and then I'll come back to justification. Uh, you can also look at the inertial range and you can ask what is the, the effect of the thermal noise on the inertial range. Um, if I scale things with integral scale units, then I find that the, uh, the, the thermal noise gets even smaller. Um, of course, on, as you might imagine, on integral scales, thermal noise is much less important than it is in the dissipation range. Um, and in, in integral scale units, you can relate that to our previous parameter. It's got this extra power of Reynolds number in it. And that means that at, at integral scales in the inertial range, this effect should be extremely weak and we can ignore it. And in fact, that's not hard to justify mathematically. If I mollify my equation as I've done here, I, I hit it with a, a, a low pass filter, I coarse grain it, then you can easily see that this thing is now nice and smooth. It's a simple Gaussian function. It's independent of, of uh, Reynolds number. And in the limit of large Reynolds number, both the direct effect of viscosity and the direct effect of noise disappear and I'm back to the usual uh, framework of weak Euler solutions describing the dynamics in the inertial range of the flow. But we know that the viscosity has a strong indir indirect effect in the inertial range. And I'm going to argue that the thermal noise likewise has a strong indirect effect in the inertial range. Um, 
let's first of all sort of just try to be naive about it and say what what would we naively expect uh, so we can sort of destroy the naive expectation but if i if i consider the 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 the, the fluctuating navier stokes equation heuristically i can write down a path integral using the so called ansager mockup action and if i do that i now get a path integral representation of the transition probability with an Ansager mock-up action that I've written here. And of course, this large prefactor you know, for large Reynolds number is just a manifestation that the noise is extremely weak on, in, on, on inertial range scales. Um, I want to mention for the mathematicians that this Ansager mock-up action has in fact been rigorously derived um, for stochastic lattice gases in the previous scaling limit that I talked about before. That is, if you take the limit of lambda going to zero with Reynolds number fixed, then there's a rigorous large deviations result that says, in fact, with probability going to one, you'll see deterministic Navier-Stokes equation, and then large deviations governed by this, uh, this rate function. However, that limit requires also taking the energy dissipation very, very tiny. And the physically interesting limit for turbulent flow is not that limit. The, the physically interesting limit is very large Reynolds number with both dissipation and thermal noise fixed. And in that limit, I'm going to argue that you don't get this large deviations result at all. Something quite different occurs. So if you make a, in fact, you can understand the source of the breakdown in a simple way. You simply try to make a naive saddle point approximation to the path interval. If I do that, then I should get the, the, the standard uh, saddle point, uh, uh, this will be um, an exponential, um, and my action will be the bare action, uh, the Ansager mock-up action. And that means that with probability going to one, I should see a solution of the Euler equation with my given initial data, okay? But there's a problem with this because in the limit of very, very high Reynolds number, what has been shown is that the, such the uh, Euler solutions are not unique, even if you require that they be dissipative. And of course, there's been a great many work, including by Camillo de Lellis here, who is one of the pioneers in this subject about this. Um, even if you assume that you have Ansager's exponent, one third, you have non-uniqueness of such Euler solutions. And so in fact, there's a fundamental problem because the standard saddle point approximations always assume that for a given initial data, there's a unique solution that carries the weight of the probability and the limit. Well, this is exactly the setting in which one expects what's called spontaneous stochasticity, which was originally argued for Lagrangian particles by, uh, in, in a turbulent flow by Bernard Goetzky and Kupiainen in this landmark paper in 1998. And for people that may not have heard about this, I'll just say that uh, it's a phenomenon that's very, very closely related or closely analogous to zero, zero temperature phase transitions in equilibrium statistical mechanics. And the point is that when you have non-unique solutions, those are the black curves in this picture, and you add on top of it some external noise, as you let the noise get smaller and smaller, you don't have to have a unique solution in the limit. You don't have to have a deterministic solution. Uh, as the noise gets weaker and weaker, you can have a non-trivial probability distribution on these limiting non-unique solutions, just like in equal, zero temperature phase transitions, if you have non-unique ground states, you can get a non-trivial uh, probability distribution on the ground states in the zero temperature limit. Now, I'll mention that Bernard et al. originally considered uh, this phenomenon for uh, turbulent Lagrangian particle trajectories, but it was discussed, uh, I think, first for the Eulerian case by Malayabov for shell models, and I'll say more about that shortly. Um, this effect that I'm claiming here, that this, there should be spontaneous stochasticity, can actually be understood from works of Ruel and Lorentz put together. Uh, so David Ruel was, I think, the first person that I know to consider the question of how fluctuations influence turbulence. And he reached an important conclusion in his paper in 1979, which is that it takes only a, a time of order the Komogorov time for thermal noise to change the motions at the Komogorov scale. Um, I'll just em emphasize that in our notations, his estimate for that time is given here. 
uh, the thing inside the logarithm is what I called one over, it's one over the thing I called theta k. Um, and then you have also this thing, which is the Komogor of uh, uh, time. And so even if theta k gets extremely tiny, like 10 to the minus eight in the atmospheric boundary layer, this ends up not being such a big number. Uh, and so it's only order 10. And so within maybe 10 Komogorov times, thermal noise will change the solution that you're seeing at the dissipation scale. But then a mechanism that was discussed in a very important paper by Edward Lorenz in 1969 takes over. And I'll just read here what he says. This is actually a, a paper whose importance has not been fully appreciated uh, up until the present time, I would say, including by myself. I didn't appreciate it for a long time either. But as, as he says in his abstract, it is proposed that certain formally deterministic fluid systems, which possess many scales of motion, are observationally indistinguishable from indeterministic systems, specifically that two states of the system, differing initially by a small observational error, will evolve into two states differing as greatly as randomly chosen states of the system within a finite time interval. It doesn't take infinitely long times to see statistical behavior from a deterministic dynamic that can happen in finite time. And you cannot lengthen that time by reducing the amplitude of the initial error. Okay, now I'm going to discuss the mechanism for that shortly, but the basic idea of Lorentz's idea of Lorentz's claim was what has now been called the inverse error cascade. It's closely related to the original considerations of Onsager, that if you add up all the eddy turnover times in a, in a Komogor of inertial range, they sum up to a finite number. And in inverse, those are the times that it takes for the energy ca to cascade from small scales to large scales. And as you let the noise get infinitesimally weak, it takes only a finite amount of time for the energy to propagate from the smallest scale up to the, to the scale of the, of, of the integral scale. Okay, so to try to make this more substantial, we've done numerical studies with uh, the Sabra model. Uh, this is a Sabra model of fluctuating Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, so we've taken the, taken the standard Sabra model, but then we've added in uh, thermal noise. Uh, the Sabra model has a, 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 a Liouville theorem and it conserves kinetic energy. That means that this is the correct fluctuation dissipation relation that will lead to a usual Gaussian Gibbs distribution, which is just what you see for Navier-Stokes. So this is a simple toy problem that will give rise to the same phenomenon as a nice Gaussian Gibbs distribution. Um, and so it is a, is a model with which we can now see whether our heuristic arguments are correct. And unlike with, with fluctuating Navier-Stokes equation where you're limited in Reynolds number, we can go to very high Reynolds number, atmospheric boundary layer and higher uh, to see the effects of Reynolds number. I will mention that equipartition is now different in this model because there's no increase in number of modes. And so the equipartition spectrum is actually one over K. If I just look at the variance, if I look at the energy per mode, it becomes independent of, of uh, uh, shell number in this model. Um, and, and this means that we're actually going to be underestimating the effects of thermal noise in this model because unlike for Navier-Stokes where the equipartition spectrum grows with wave number, like K squared in dimension three, here the, the equipartition spectrum actually decays like one over K. Also, I should mention that the far dissipation range is different in the, in the shell model. It doesn't decay exponentially in the far dissipation range. There's a stretched exponential uh, with a, a power in the exponent K to the alpha where alpha is the log base two of the golden ratio. This was first worked out by Kadanoff and, and collaborators. And that slower decay also means that uh, it's going to be harder to see the effects of thermal noise there than in Navier-Stokes where the, 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 the spectrum decays faster exponentially. So we're going to be underestimating the effects of thermal noise with these calculations. Okay, so to do this, we used a simple uh, slave, eater, uh, slave Taylor Edo scheme. This is something we found from the literature. Um, it's roughly as the same type of convergence as conventional deterministic models for the shell model. 
um, uh, strong free abs order, although generally we actually see second order convergence. We, uh, we've checked carefully the convergence of the method. Um, we're doing all the numerics quite carefully to convince people uh, we're making no mistake. Um, this is the spectrum. Okay, so I'm going to show you the preliminary results. And the blue curve is without noise. And then you see the conventional inertial range. And then you see the, um, the, 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 the stretched exponential decay. By the way, we've verified the conventional stretched exponential decay. Um, uh, uh, um, we also see the, if we turn off the noise, we see the um, uh, strong intermittency that was predicted by Bob Kreikman in 1967. Uh, all those effects are there, but they're virtual reality. As soon as you turn on the thermal noise, you get something completely different. You actually go to equipartition at a scale roughly 10 or 20 times below the Kolmogorov scale. I should say we've normalized things here. So zero is the Kolmogorov wave number. OK, so uh, you, you only go a factor of 10 or 20 below. And suddenly, you don't see all the usual predictions of far dissipation range. You see equipartition. Um, I, I'm going to just mention in passing that um, uh, I can sh maybe say more about this, but uh, these predictions have been confirmed. Um, we've been told by John Bell and Alex Garcia, John Bell at Lawrence Berkeley, who's actually under our encouragement done a numerical simulation with fluctuating Navier-Stokes equation. And indeed, he's verified the cartoon that we see. So this has now been seen beyond the shell model that I'm showing here. But in fact, you get effects that propagate, I mean, that appear from the thermal noise much earlier than 10 or 20 times below the Kolmogorov scale, if you look at the correct statistics. So here, what I'm looking at are uh, negative order structure functions. I've done this in a somewhat unusual way. This quantity that I call a p-norm is not the mathematician's uh, little lp norm. It's actually with a negative p, but it's the pth order structure function of the shell amplitude. Um, uh, for a negative value of p, and then I take the one over pth power. And they also, of course, have uh, you know, constant values in the, the limiting Gaussian uh, distribution. And we, by the way, we've checked that this is Gaussian at the highest wave numbers to very, very good approximation. It becomes very accurately Gaussian at the high wave numbers with the temperature that we're, 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 we're putting in. And what you can see is that when I look at these negative order structure functions, the deviations appear already at the Kolmogorov scale and earlier. Uh, if you want to do similar studies of this for fluid turbulence, then the analogs of this would be some kind of wavelet structure functions, maybe with uh, some analytic Morse wavelet, something like that. But the problem there is that to, to see these effects, you would have to very, very accurately resolve velocity fluctuations down to uh, you know, a, a, a thousandth or a hundred thousandth of the Komogoro velocity. So it would require extremely accurate measurements, which we can do numerically, but that might be quite hard experimentally. But the effects of the thermal noise appear quite early in the, already at the Komogorov scale. Um, the reason for that, the reason that they appear in these negative order structure functions is because there's strong intermittency. So what I'm showing you here are snapshots from the simulation where we average over one Komogorov time. Okay, so we're not averaging over long times, we're averaging over one viscous time scale at the, the Kolmogorov scale. And what you can see is that the equipartition, that flat region, fluctuates a lot. And this is due to the well-known effect of intermittency, which appears in the shell models as well as in Navier-Stokes. Uh, there are strong bursts, like in these examples here and here, where the, 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 the burst propagates deep into the traditional viscous range. And then there are lulls, very quiet regions, where the equipartition goes way below the Kolmogorov scale into the traditional inertial range. And the fact that we're seeing that thermal effect in those negative order structure functions emphasizes events like this one and like this one. And that's why you see the thermal fluctuation effects so early in the, in the, in the negative order structure functions. OK, so we've actually calculated the statistics of the length scales where you first see equipartition, as I've discussed it here, and then compared it with a prediction of, of the multifractal model. 
for the smallest length scale in a turbulent flow. This was first done by Paladin and Volpiani back in the 1980s. Um, and what you see is there, in fact, is a, a, a good correlation. I should say, we, we, we're, we're going to do this with the uh, anomalous scaling that comes from the shell model itself, this fluctuating shell model itself. But here I've just compared it with some standard uh, phenomenological models that are known to fit well the shell model scaling. Uh, they all agree pretty well with each other. This is the distribution of those traditional cutoff lengths. And you can see it's closely related with this equipartition scale, the scale where you first start to see thermal equipartition, except the thermal equipartition happens uh, maybe about you know, uh, one or two shells later. So the in physical interpretation is you have strong bursts, and then equipartition happens only a few shells after that strong burst ends when it's killed by viscosity. This highest, the, the, high, the, mo the most singular event that we've seen in our simulation um, is about 64 times the Kolmogorov wave number at Reynolds number 10 to the seven. Um, in the atmospheric boundary layer for the, 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 the mean free path of air, this would give a, a length scale, the smallest length scale we've observed, which is you know about eight millimeter, eight micrometers, eight microns. That's still 124 times the mean free path. So at least uh, in the atmospheric boundary layer, based on our analysis, you would expect that a hydrodynamic approximation, a fluctuating hydrodynamic approximation, is still valid. But there is a danger, as Srini already mentioned, of the hydrodynamic approximation breaking down if you go to sufficiently high Reynolds number, because those length scales depend on Reynolds number. Um, I should say that um, uh, Srini mentioned the argument that he, uh, the calculation he did in 1978. I think he'll be gratified to know that it was one of his mentors who first published this estimate. Uh, it, it was done by Stan Colson in 1959. And okay, Corson, Corson's uh, estimate that Srini mentioned about this cutoff length. Yeah, somebody should turn off their phone. Can somebody turn mute their mic? It's Sasha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Who, who's the who's running the meeting? Can do it. Ah, uh, um, I can do that. How do I do that? Okay. Go to participants. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And. And you should I have power. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Okay. It stopped anyway. Okay. Yeah, so okay. I, I can I can do that if I want to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank so anyways, you. so anyways, this estimate uh, that that sort of it, it's easy to generalize Corson's considerations to the to the picture of a you know multifractal model. Um, if you put h equals one third, this is Corson's estimate. If you put h equals zero, then this is actually Srini's eta infinity. And what you can see is that, in fact, um, if, as long as the holder exponents are all positive, then as Reynolds number gets bigger and bigger, uh, the, 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 the separation between the mean free path and that smallest length scale gets larger and larger. But if H gets zero or even negative, and as we know, Lorray solutions, I mean, Lorray solutions of Navier Stokes, if they have singularities, actually require negative exponents, um, then in fact, the hydrodynamic approximation could break down. Um, and so uh, there's, an, there's actually a quite interesting question as you go to higher and higher Reynolds numbers, uh, whether this length scale will actually get down to the mean free path. If it does, then you would have to use something like fluctuating Boltzmann equation. And I should just mention uh, that would require fluctuating nonlinear Boltzmann equation, the theory of which has just been re uh, worked out by one of our Simons collaborators, Freddie Boucher. Uh, so we know how to put thermal noise also in the Boltzmann equation if we need to use that. Okay, now let me talk about the, the, the evidence for uh, inertial range spontaneous stochasticity. Uh, what we have done is we've taken the, the uh, there's an exact K41 solution for the shell model. It's an exact stationary solution, but unstable. And what we take is that exact K41 initial data, and then we add in the thermal noise. Then, of course, it, it becomes unstable. It starts developing an ensemble of solutions. And we're looking at the variance of that solution here uh, as a function of time. So 
how does that ensemble of solutions start to depart? How does that variance in that ensemble grow? In the little L2 norm. So this is the energy norm for the shell model. And what you see first is linear thermal growth, as you would expect from the thermal noise. Then you get the Ruel exponential range. This is what Ruel predicted in 1979. But then you go over into the Lorentz, Kraken, and Leith linear power law, which is the, 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 the sort of the signature, or it's one of the signs that you probably are having what I called spontaneous stochasticity. A, a more precise analysis of this is showing that variance uh, and in wave number. And so I'm showing how this variance builds up over time as a function of wave number. So if I sum these up, I'm getting this curve over here. So if I sum over shells, I'm going to get this total variance. And what you see is that the variance starts at the small scale. It begins to build up with this exponential growth. And then you have this propagation backward through this front. And this is the inverse error cascade of Lorentz. In fact, this is almost identical to a, a, a figure from Lorentz's 1969 paper where he predicted that this kind of phenomenon would happen. So in fact, we're seeing exactly the inverse cascade of Lorentz. What this is telling us, by the way, is that forget about the flap of butterfly wings, forget about seagulls, forget about microorganisms, uh, molecular motions, the thermal noise uh, in one large eddy turnover time will affect the largest scales of the flow. Okay, so depending on the realization of the thermal noise, you will see different behavior, different individual realizations in the, in the integral scale of the flow in one large eddy turnover time. Now, to fully verify spontaneous stochasticity, um, stay tuned, there's more to be done. I'm gonna talk about that in a second, what sort of remains to be done, but we're, we're, we're continuing to work on all these aspects. Let me just say a little bit about theory. So all of this has been numerics. We want to develop some analytical understanding. Um, and we've begun to develop a renormalization group theory of, of spontaneous stochasticity. Um, so far, I looked at quite simple toy problems. And so here is the, the simplest toy problem that exhibits the phenomenon. Um, it's the standard textbook example where you have non-unique solutions. You just have an ODE with a, a holder type singularity. So these are non-Lipschitz. Uh, they have a continuum of non-unique solutions. And the, and the non-uniqueness is how long you wait at the origin before you depart by the standard solution you would get from separation of variables. Um, this kind of model has been extensively studied for a couple decades by probabilists, except that it's generally taken to be really singular. To make it more physical, we put in a viscous, an analog of a viscous cutoff. So the model is actually smooth. Um, and the point is that we want to show that you get st uh, stochastic solutions in the limit where simultaneously the noise goes to zero and this regularization scale go to zero. So taking the Reynolds number going to infinity. Here I've just shown you a plot that illustrates the basic physics mechanism. And that is that if I look at different levels of noise, and so uh, in this context, this would be the Schmidt number. But if, so this is um, uh, strong noise up here, uh, intermediate noise, very weak noise here. Then what you find is that independent of those noises, so here that Schmidt number is assuming I'm interpreting this as a Lagrangian particle in a turbulent flow. Then what you find is that independent of the noise level at long times, you go over to the scaling given by the extremal solutions of the dynamics. And this is the essential mechanism of what's called spontaneous stochasticity is you forget the level of the external noise, you forget the precise initial data, and at long times you have a universal behavior uh, that doesn't depend on them. And of course, this exactly calls for a renormalization group type argument. It's very similar to what happens in critical system, where you forget at large scales the microscopic lattice, uh, the, the features of the microscopic lattice, the detailed Hamiltonian. You only remember at large scales, much larger than the lattice spacing, the, the, the universality class. So here we've done a similar renormalization group where we now want to come up with effective initial data. So this would be a terrible idea of what I'm, so what I'm doing here, which is sort of integrating out the early times and only then keeping some time, you know, late time solution because I would no longer know the exact initial data. And for a standard initial value problem, that would be a horrible idea. Here it's the right idea because 
the, the, the dynamics doesn't care about the precise initial data. So what you do is you integrate out early times, which means I don't know what the precise noise was in this equation at the early times. I've integrated it out. But then when I rescale, and I also look at the effective dynamics and the effective noise, you get nice RG flow equations, and we've analyzed them completely for this simple toy problem. We've understand all the, the universality domains, the renormalization group fixed points, their domains of attraction. And what you find is that uh, you have, at least in the symmetric case, a completely universal fixed point that governs a, you know, almost every initial data, almost every perturbation. And it's, it's spontaneously stochastic. Here, what I show is what happens when you let the Reynolds and the Piclet number go to infinity together. So this is what determines the regularization of the, of the velocity. This is what determines the strength of the noise. As you let both of those get bigger and bigger, the, 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 the solution stays random and it concentrates on these two extremal solutions. So it's actually very easing-like. Um, although there are a continuum of ground states, only two of them are selected in the limit, the two extremal solutions. And we've also worked out in the same framework even the large deviations theory that tells you how the probability disappears uh, in between. And we can get that from the RG flow approach to the fixed point. Okay, but th this phenomenon should happen in much more um, uh, complicated cases. I've already tried to tell you that it should occur in uh, homogeneous isotropic turbulence. Here's a beautiful example that comes from uh, a work that was just published in the past year, a well-known problem that uh, uh, Sasha Migdal is going to talk to you about more from his point of view, I believe. Um, and that is uh, a self-preserving or equilibrium mixing layer where you start off with a singular vortex sheet um, and then it goes through this beautiful mixing. Um, and uh, the, it's known in this problem, unlike for, for Navier-Stokes in, in general for homogeneous isotropic turbulence, that in 3D, that uh, you get nice weak solutions in the zero, in the infinite Reynolds number limit. But there can be more than one Euler solution uh, for such vortex sheet initial data, even assuming that they're dissipative, as Lazo Saklidi uh, discussed in a paper and also more recent work. So again, this is exactly the situation where you expect spontaneous stochasticity because of this non-uniqueness of the limiting solutions. And in fact, there's a very nice paper by Simon Thalabard et al. just this year, where they have done a, a, a very careful, precise um, numerical uh, study of this and provided strong evidence of what is called spontaneous stochasticity, uh, where they find that as you regularize this flow with different regularizations, either by putting in viscosity or by putting in a point right vortex regularization and using um, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, Birkhoff equations, Birkhoff rot, then uh, it, with any of those regularizations, as you remove the regularization and you simultaneously remove the noise, what you find is that, that you always bend over to the same limiting curve for the separation of the solutions. Here, the measure of separation, like in the shell model case, is an energy norm where you're looking at different realizations with different noise, one U, one U prime, this is the V and V prime, so this is a two-dimensional case. This is just the energy uh, norm, the, the, the two particle uh, distance, if you like. And what you find is that in the limit, all of these bend over to the same curve. And as Lorenz said, in a time which is independent of how small you take this noise, you bend over here to something which is, 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 is random. Okay, and so this is a very strong numerical evidence, at least, that in this case you have what's called spontaneous stochasticity of the Eulerian variety. And of course, this is a prime target of the kind of renormalization group analysis that I, I mentioned earlier. Okay, so I think I, I can stop here um, and then take questions um, if we have time. Um, uh, the, the point is that the fluctuating Navier Stokes equation, I'm arguing, is um, the correct model of the dissipation range of a turbulent flow. Um, uh, the Navier-Stokes equation, um, uh, you know, is, is actually, um, uh, you know, still useful to give us some idea and direction on what's happening at those scales, but we believe it, it misses a lot of important physics. Um, and there, there can be a lot of effects um, on sub Kolmogorov scale processes that are important in uh, climate and in engineering. Um, 
uh, the, the, the noise propagates up uh, in one large eddy turnover time to integral scales. And this supports uh, arguments that Tim Palmer at Oxford has been making that uh, weather and climate models should be intrinsically stochastic. And then we've begun to make some fundamental renormalization group theory of this phenomenon. Okay, so I, I thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Gregory. So um, it's open for questions. Uh, I have a question, but I should be uh, reasonable and ask everybody else if they have questions. Charlie. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, Greg, thanks very much for this. Uh, I, yeah, it's kind of surprising that nobody plugged the numbers in like you did before. <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. But now, uh, and, and it, it's clear that, um, you know, this has many ra ramifications and you're suggesting many observable effect in, in a certain sense, observable. Um, but what I, so I have two, two questions. One in particular is um, looking at the fluctuations at very small scales. Is there a chance of, of I mean, you getting down to optical scattering methods, the way they look at uh, distributions and gases and so on. Is, is that a tool that's, and I, and I don't mean PIV, right? I, I, I mean, the, the kind of scattering, liquid scattering. gas yeah. optical. I think this is really a question for Srini. So Srini yeah, should be yeah, the problem is, um, while I have no problem believing that uh, uh, thermal fluctuations could have some impact, even in the inertial range, um, I think it would be uh, very weak, I thought. I always thought they would be very wow. weak. But uh, what I, one thing you said uh, made some um, impact on me, and that is, if you computed negative moments, then it could show up very much uh, earlier. Uh, we uh, empirically have had many difficulties with negative moments. And uh, I always thought, uh, well, it is a question of whether uh, data have converged and things like that. It may well be that still is the case, but I can see that negative moments coming from very small amplitudes. Uh, it may very well be that uh, thermal fluctuations uh, may make a, a selective appearance there. But in general, uh, for an experimentalist who is not concerned such, with such extreme uh, things, uh, I always thought that uh, in large scale quantities, thermal noise has no effect whatsoever. The same way butterfly effect has no, no effect whatsoever. Um, in simulations is another story. You can of course compute it. Navier-Stokes equations, you put it in a computer and do it, um, as uh, uh, nicely as you want in principle. It's a nice virtual reality. So it's a virtual reality uh, maybe, but you should not uh, underestimate the fact that Navier-Stokes equations are of interest to a lot of people on their own, whether they actually mean anything to physical things or not. So it is not exactly virtual reality. So in some sense, you are exaggerating the issue to make your point is how I see it. But I think you have a fundamental point. You have a fundamental point that uh, even very simple estimates like the ones I made, if you choose the smallest scale as not the Kolmogorov scale, but uh, you know the eta minimum as I called it, you get into the realm where you have to worry about them. Well, I mean, I, I, I would disagree a little bit. I mean, I would say that it's, you, it's forget about eta min, I mean, eta infinity. I mean, it, when you're going to scales 10 times smaller than the Kolmogorov scale, yeah, that's like yeah. what you've done in some of your simulations with uh, uh, Kershid, for example. Yeah, that's negative and, box, remember. Yeah, I'm saying, so then I'm saying those simulations are virtual reality. Let, let, let me finish my, my question before we go on. Yeah, yes. because I, the other half of the question is going the other direction. Uh, uh, ultimately, in some sense, what we're interested in with turbulence are the large scale transport, dissipation, drag, et cetera, th these things. These are very average. They're bulk averaged, averaged over macroscopic lengths and average over macroscopic time scales. Now, uh, is there, any indication? I mean, it may changing realizations of a turbulent flow. Okay, it's one thing, but is this the large scale statistics and the transport properties of the flow going to change? 
Well, no, I mean, I, so first of all, I yeah. think when you say we, you mean mainly engineers, of course. The climate people, I'm climate, atmospheric, climate, atmosp climate, climate, climate. Oh, climate also, yes, of course. Yeah. But, but I mean, for, but, but when you're doing climate, you're looking at averages of the, um, you know, uh, of what equations? Because the equations that you're looking at are heavily parameterized. Nobody's using Navier-Stokes. Okay, okay, okay. In principle, climate. In okay. principle. <laughs> but I'm saying, but in okay. fact, this is quite important because uh, as, as climate models start to become better and better resolved, they're getting down to scales, you know, maybe in a decade where you're at a kilometer resolution, where the, the effects of the turbulence of the integral scale are going to be important. And our, our analysis sort of fully supports the arguments that Tim Palmer has been making that all of these models should be stochastic. And, and you should read his works for multiple uh, ramifications of that, among other things, that it actually makes the numerics easier because you not only get increased fidelity and predictive power, but you don't have to carry as much precision. Right, and so right. understanding what the nature of the beast is, is extremely important. But, but drag, in, drag in a pipe, drag yeah. in a pipe. But, but yes, okay, but so, so for some issues, it, it's very important to know what the statistics are. Um, and the, the question is, the answer is that I don't believe that thermal noise is important. And in fact, what I was saying is that when you have this phenomenon of spontaneous stochasticity, it doesn't really matter what kind of noise you have at small scale. The behavior you should get out should be universal at large scales. Okay, and um, in, 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 in fact, you know, in, in reality, it's not gonna be thermal noise in nature. You're gonna have little microorganisms swimming in the ocean whose perturbations are much bigger than thermal noise. But the only thing special about thermal noise is it, it's inevitable. You cannot get rid of it, okay? It's always there intrinsically uh, because it comes from the molecules. And so therefore, it's, an, it's a strong argument that turbulence is intrinsically unpredictable. There's nothing you can do that would control the fluid that would ever make it predictable. You may comment to that. Yes. Yes, please. Well, uh, I totally agree with you. In fact, I will give arguments in favor of that same thing. But what I would like to say is that the real problem is to find dynamical mechanism of enhancing the temperature effects to such a huge macroscopic things as fluctuating vortex structures. That's the real problem. You agree with that? Yes, of course. I mean, I think I would say that, I mean, we understand roughly speaking that it's chaotic properties of the model and the in the shell model that I looked at, there's a numerically determined spectrum of Lyapunov exponents. Uh, they roughly go like the Kolmogorov time scale at a given scale. And this is the underlying mechanism in the shell model that magnifies the error from the small scales up to the large scales. Um, I think as a statistical physicist, I wouldn't want to attempt to prove ergodicity. That's some, a, a problem that's been open for a long time. But I, I would hope that we can get better understanding at the level of, say, green Kubo formulas, where you assume ergodicity that makes the green Kubo integrands converge, but then that would allow you to understand what the effective noise and the effective dissipation of the turbulent flow are. But yes, I mean, I, I agree. We, we, there's a lot we need to understand about the detailed mechanism of this. I just want to make a remark for uh, Charlie's question. Even engineers are interested in small scale quantities. Oh, if yes. you're a combustion engineer, that's really what you care about. And so with that remark, I think we should move on to Sasha Migdal. Thank you, Gregory. Mm -hmm.